Time well, now to talk sport with Nick Lockyer and the Australian World Cup squad has been revealed. Take us through the lineup, Nick. Yeah, it's been uh, it's been a good one for Australia. It looks very strong this lineup. Uh, Michael Clark is the captain. He's been named. George Bailey is vice captain. Pat Cummins, Xavier Doherty is the spinner. James Faulkner, Aaron Finch to open the batting with Dave Warner. Uh, Brad Haddon has won the wicket keepers spot. Josh Hazelwood, Mitch Johnson, Mitch Marsh, Glenn Maxwell, Steve Smith. Mitchell Stark and Shane Watson. Now to, jo- to dissect the lineup, Trent Copeland joins us. And Trent, Michael Clark, the obvious one. Uh, w- what's your reaction to that? Yeah, I think he had to be there. He's the, I guess, the key figure in Australia's batting lineup, but also he's the leader of the team. And I think no matter what the scenario was around his hamstring, if there was a chance that he could make it for that first game or even the second game, as Rod Marsh mentioned. Uh, I think he had to be there and I, I've seen him in the gym this week he's around the Sydney test and he's been doing three sessions a day you know he's looking good he's doing all the exercises and he said in the press conference this morning that he feels confident that he's stuck to his regime and, and the medical staff will make that call at the end of the day but he feels confident that he's moving in the right direction. How risky is it including him in in such a massive tournament? Well I, I think it would be a lot more risky if we were playing away from home uh, when the logistics around replacing players becomes a little bit more difficult. But given that we're going to have domestic cricket going on, we're going to have uh, a series, a tri-series going on in Australia, which potentially he won't play any part in. But we'll be able to monitor having replacement players playing international cricket. We'll have guys playing domestic cricket. And a simple replacement will be a flight to Melbourne yep. or a flight to Hobart. You know, it won't be a flight across the world to the other side. And um, I guess something that Michael Clark would need to decide a lot earlier. We have the luxury, I guess, of waiting until that last moment. Now, George Bailey is the man named vice-captain. He'll probably, he'll captain this team until uh, Clark returns. How important is he to this team? Yeah, very important. And he's shown over a long period of time that he's been, whenever he's been asked, he's been like a real chameleon for Australia. Whenever he's required to come in and do the hard yards when we're four for not many, he comes in and he gets the job done. Uh, But also when Australia are dictating and he needs to come in and score very quickly, he's got the ability to do that too. But I think he's a very astute leader. He's a good tactician and we've heard so many times about him being a great team man as well. Um, And I guess it's shown by the fact that he's been uh, given the opportunity to captain his IPL side in India. There's a lot of people around the world that think he's a great leader. And I heard Rod Marsh say this morning in the press conference, they don't want to burden Stephen Smith with too much. Uh, He's just had the captain Australia... Uh, over three test matches in, in his home country. He's scored a mountain of runs and they just want him to be able to go out um, and have the freedom of just worrying about scoring runs because he's in such a rich vein of form. So I think it's a, a great luxury that we've got at the moment. We've got three guys that are well and truly capable and that's not even mentioning Brad Haddon, Shane Watson that have captain Australia before. Now you talk about Steve Smith there. He has, he's in the form of his life. He's just incredible. His performance in the uh, Indian Test Series, look, even when he's uh, playing in Test matches, he's scoring sixes uh, at will. And um, uh, look, how do you think that that would have reflected on him if, if he'd have been named captain and they'd, uh, they'd gone, they'd sort of looked to the future? Uh, do you think it would have been too much of a burden for him or, or would, it, would he have thrived under the pressure as he's done all summer? Well, the interesting thing is that we so often talk about the burden of captaincy and, and even if you recall Michael Clark batting at number five and scoring 300 uh, you know, and all these massive scores from number five and then there was a talk of the importance of our best batter moving up to number four and the significance of that and how difficult it is to take on. Well, Steve Smith has not only taken on the captaincy in this series, but he's also seamlessly moved up from number five to number four and just churned out 100 after 100. So I think, you know, whilst a lot of people would say, yes, it would be difficult, there's no reason to suggest why he couldn't do it. I think the important thing is he's only 25 years old um, and let's give him the best chance to be this dominant figure for so long. And he achieved his own milestone during the week, didn't he? Was there? Did he surpass the record of Don Bradman's? Yeah, not bad. <laughs> Passing the Don, not too many people can say that in their lifetime, can they? And at 25. Yeah, exactly. And we've run out of superlatives for him this summer. It's, <laughs> it's really been tough to every day say, wow, how good is Steve Smith? Wow, how good is Steve Smith? And it becomes, you know, a broken record type scenario. But... How good is it to see as an Australian cricket lover and Australian cricket fan that someone like that, who 18 months ago wasn't solidified in the test team, let alone now the captain and the number four and the leading figure in that batting lineup? Because if you take him out of that and Michael Clark as well, 
it becomes you know a little bit fragile and then we've got someone like Brad Haddon and Chris Rogers who are upwards of 36, 37. So I think he's such an important figure moving forward for Australian cricket. Now, there was a lot of anticipation, obviously, ahead of this uh, announcement of the lineup. Were there any surprises, in your view, in terms of who they chose? I guess the controversial ones, well, controversial in my eyes, was uh, the spin role uh, that Rod Marsh came out and said this morning that he was very happy with um, the way they toyed around with it a little bit over the last few one-day series. Uh, they make no excuses for the fact that they wanted to test out a few different guys. They named that uh, Maxwell was the one to turn it back into the right-hander and they needed someone to then turn it away and they didn't feel that uh, the two young leg spinners, Zampa and Boyce, that would have been in the mix, I guess, um, were ready for it yet. Particularly, with, they've made a lot of chat this morning about the fact that there's only four, four fielders allowed outside the, uh, the circle now with the fielding restrictions um, and they wanted a, a bit more bit more safety and I guess some of they knew what to expect with Xavier Doherty. The others, I guess Ryan Harris would would have been, you know, in Australian public's thoughts as to, you know, being involved because he's such a prominent figure in test cricket. Um, but Rod Marsh said this morning again when he walked up to him last night to say, uh, Rhino, he said, don't worry mate, I know. So he sort of <laughs> knew that he wasn't going to be involved as much as he would have liked to. I guess the other ones, Kane Richardson's played a lot. In the last little while, um, he would have been unlucky. And then young guys from New South Wales, Sean Abbott and Garinda Sandu, have been mentioned as well. But um, you know, I think we've got a very solid, very flexible lineup in that 15-man squad. And who is going to miss out? You know, that is such a strong squad. Who are the four people that aren't going to play in that first game? That's a question as well. Nathan Lyon unlucky. Yeah, unlucky, and he hasn't played a one-day international in his own country yet. So I don't know whether that will have played its part, whether that was a bit of an unknown. But, uh, you know, playing with him at New South Wales and seeing his prowess in one-day cricket as well, it's a little bit of a shock. But, uh, again, it was about having someone that spun the ball the other way to Glenn Maxwell. And um, I think at times too, I think you'll probably see that we won't play a spinner. There'll be times where we play more quicks than, than the spin options and then Glenn Maxwell becomes that option if we need it. Um, but at places like the Wacker and the Gabba where there's a bit more bounce and, and carry, you know, we could see the likes of Stark, Johnson, Hazelwood with Faulkner, Marsh and Watson as the priority seam options and then just Maxwell to fill in. Now, finally, just before we go, the big bash last night. Got to get your thoughts on that game. It was a phenomenal finish to the to the clash. You must hate seeing the stars get up though, mate. Oh, as a mate. sixer, and look at Callum Ferguson here. He almost pulls off one of the most incredible runouts you've ever seen. Nathan Remington just uh, unfortunately breaks the uh, stumps before the ball gets there. Mate, the stars—they're on fire, aren't they? It was incredible to see, and I, the last two games I've watched the stars play against my sixes the other night. Uh, with that uh, super over win and then last night it seems like Eddie Maguire's written the script and it's, <laughs> it's locked in but uh, yeah they're a dangerous side and, and that was an incredible advertisement for what is a great tournament. Beautiful, thanks for coming in and joining us Trent and no uh, let's go to the Aussies for the World Cup.